We begin this hour with breaking news. Thousands of Canadian jobs are being cut by Bombardier as the company restructures. Poured in billions of taxpayer dollars to prop the company up. This is Canada's only motorcycle. A Riker, spelled with a Y, which references the Spider variants, which refers to the Y frame, which refers to a snowmobile. Oh, so Canada's contribution to motorcycling is a summer snowmobile. Cool, that's good for stereotypes. <laughs> oh, boy. Boy. Yvonne's appendix burst, leaking bacteria like battery acid in his abdomen. The assault on his body is as inexorable as the snow attacking these country roads, so Yvonne dies. Before he can reach the hospital, he was two years old. While that immovable organ was agonizing his son, Joseph Armand Bombardier's invention for winter mobility lay frozen in his shed, meters away, but unfinished. A snow car. Joseph restarts work with grievous determination, bolting tank track to car engine and filling in the blanks. Loto Neige Bombardier is completed in the year Yvonne would have turned five. A lifesaver for snowscape preachers, trappers, surveyors, and doctors. When Canada starts plowing roads in the 50s, our snow car yeah, it becomes a novelty. But who doesn't like novel ideas? Bombardier shrinks his design to a plaything, inventing the first snowmobile in 1959. Named the ski dog to dig its sled dogs, the sloppy brochure designer paints its ski do. And that solidifies. Well, hey, bud, how about a ski do? Oh, hey, eh? I'll go for a ski do. So sorry, boot is French there. Well, we just love ski doing. The noun becomes a household name, a verb, a catch-all for any type of sled, a national treasure. Skidoo has more going for you. More going for you. I got problems on problems on problems on problems on problems on problems I solve them. I run through the money, the pressure be calling. Left all my blessings, I feel like I'm falling. The birdie is back. Tell me I'm garbage. I'm going through something. That's why I ain't calling. Phone and all right. When I ride it like a snowmobile, pushing with my legs to counterbalance, yeah, it's all right. Three wide tracks feel all of the road, shivering my fingers. Let me run over a braille Agatha Christie and I'll tell you who done it. But that grip isn't free. Chop the throttle and it drags to a stop like a snowmobile. Keep it pinned and you'll plow through 20 liters in 200 kilometers. The huge rear tire also pushes the front to understeer like a snowplow, but that is its heritage. Here's the key, because BRP has to do everything weird. The ball and socket means I can't lock the frunk, but it also means I need not dangle my jail master key set. And the gas cap? It's all alternative. Bombardier's second dive into innovation comes from an outsider. Motocross crasher Clayton Jacobson rests by a canal to wash gravel out of his wounds. Well, thinking earth hurts. Thinking water doesn't. But aquatic scooters are still sluggish contraptions that occasionally and briefly excite riders by castrating them on a propeller. So Clayton Jacobson floats an alternative idea. And something rapid like a dirt bike, but propelled by an inboard pump jet. This condenses Bombardier's love for the obscure. Within months, they snatch a license for the sinking prototype because they can see beneath the surface. A kind of water ski do A sea do What it is, is a sea do Is a sea do Is a sea do Doing it wet. 
doing it hot. Everybody's doing it, doing it. Everybody's doing it. The market's a little too wet behind the ears. Bombardier bleeds low sales during the adoption period. 68, 69, they jump ship in 1970, allowing Clayton to hop on with Kawasaki, where he makes big waves with their jet ski spinoff. Jet ski combines all the excitement of motorcycling, snow skiing, water skiing, and more. Big waves. For Big Green to surf to enormous success. Ouch. Bombardier tries something new, does the beta work, and then lets a competitor reap the rewards. Now, eventually, Kawasaki gets cocky, tries to fire Clayton, and loses their exclusive rights in the process, allowing Bombardier to throw their sea dew back in the pool. But even still, they gave up on a new idea and missed the opportunity to define a segment. Never again. Will Bombardier shy away from creativity? The scene is getting crowded, I'm a robber always. I don't need your approval, I'm a go my own way. My daddy told me to be first, you finish last place. The world showed me one way, I'm a go my own. Bombardier breaks 90% in their share of the snowmobile market, but still feels sore over the sea dew boo boo. Their dealerships need something to sell during summer. Get on, ski doo and go do it. Dirt bikes. A niche market populated by European shed builds fertile ground for ingenuity. Bombardier plants seeds by purchasing Rotax. These engine wizards use rotary valve induction to churn 36, 38, 40 horsepower, while the competition makes mid-twenties with barnyard piston porting. Like Chuck Norris in a kid's karate class, Can-Am enters its first motorcycle in the 1973 International Six Days Trial, stealing gold, silver, and bronze. Before anyone can say Tabarn, they head to Bonneville. Can-Am's goal is to grow interest in a road bike concept. Aimed at the popular Yamaha RD350, yet hilariously powered by a 500cc snowmobile smoker. All systems are go, and it's now or never. Yamaha runs low 110s in the modified two-stroke class. Hmm. Come see, come sob, and Bardier comes crushing them into the salt flats unleashing another breakthrough engine with triple exhaust ports, Nicosil bores, to an astonishing 136.5 miles an hour. That record remains unbroken for the next 37 years. Steep ascent. When you win first, second, and third in the AMA 250 Motocross Championship the following year, yet your press releases still include phonetics because no one's even heard of Bombardier. Bombardier. That 1974 sweep wasn't one on Rotax power alone. And Can-Am clinched first and third, honestly, but they had to poach the second place rider from Husqvarna moments before the last race of the season. It worked, on paper, to dominate the podium. On track, it felt wrong. <laughs> So begins Bombardier's power craze. Slash the suspension budget, cut the chassis, pump everything into engine power, and next year, bury the competition properly. So like the old MX bikes, this thing is fast and unruly. <laughs> Stomp the single foot brake and uh, all three wheels tug the trike in different directions, fighting over who can stop it fastest. The continuously variable transmission can't handle its own torque either. It hits with a thunk off idle. 
There's more power to weight than the previous spiders, but gone are the stable Fox and Sax shocks, gone are the Brembo brakes, gone is the traction control. At least in some modes. They say Rally is optimized for crushing gravel roads, but I don't believe them. If I meet anything rougher than a few inches, I will rip its face off. <sighs> nah, Can-Am just wanted to make something half the price, two-thirds the weight, and ten times as gnarly. Riders start getting burned by these fiery machines. Jeff Smith, the double world champion who had carte blanche to design the original podium sweeping MX-1, leaps the MX-3 prototype in testing and refuses to ride it. Jimmy Ellis, one of the podium sweepers himself, wounds a spectator during his practice session and yells that the bike is a black widow. Well, the Quebecois translate this as some type of Anglophone approval and brand the rear fender with a spider decal. It's only when American dealers complain about having to sell a murderous machine that Bombardier acknowledges their mistake and issues a recall for the sticker. Jim Ellis does ride the Black Widow in competition, briefly. He switches to Honda after the first season, reducing 20% of his horsepower to ashes, but adding 20% to his lifespan. Can-Am throws fuel on the fire in 78, following their Black Widow MX-3 with an even more ludicrous MX-4. Nicknamed the Orange Monster, its vertical power delivery is considered unrideable. So ends the bright and brief explosion of Can-Am motorcycles. By 1980, the carefully crafted Japanese brands had all arrived and extinguished Can-Am's unrefined rockets. Sailing close to their prevailing winds, Bombardier finds another niche market, a golden parachute to drift resources away from their failing motorcycle program. They toss Can-Am to a British bike builder in 83, who accomplishes little more than bringing the motorcycle company home to die four years later. The Canadian National Enduro, Can-Am's last race, I think they look proud. For two decades, the orange and yellow livery fades behind Bombardier's trains, and remarkably, planes. In 03, they jettison the entire recreational division as a splinter company, BRP. Then in 2006, a strange wind blows. The BRP quad sweeps all three podium spots at the Dakar rally. Well, it's a revelation, but also a memory. The once dominant name is resurrected within months on the very first spider. And this year, the colors return. Summer snowmobile. Why? Because it's creative and unruly and screw convention. Because how else can you ride when you don't have your balance or your motorcycle license? How do you experience the thrill of a dirt bike on the safety of water? How do you float over the snow to save your son's life? This is what Bombardier does. Weird, wild, and yes, Canadian.